Well, hello everyone uh, who's tuned in. Uh, here we are at the PDAC and uh, I'd like to talk about Arctic Star. I think a very exciting um, diamond play in, the, in Canada's uh, diamond land, Lactagra, North Yellowknife. Uh, the usual cautionary statement. And I, I am the qualified person for the technical data in this presentation. Um, yeah, so we've been going a long time. We're, we're true survivors, 2001. Uh, primarily, vast majority focus on um, on uh, diamond exploration, and we've we've had our technical successes. But I think now finally we we uh, we've had a possible economic success, and that's in our flagship um, diagrass. It's um, in the Lactograd district where over twenty billion dollars worth of diamonds have been um, been mined already. Uh, it's a joint venture. Uh, we're, we're the majority venture and the managers of the project. And uh, it's 81.5% um, Arctic and 18.5% Margaret Lake. And uh, we also have a couple other properties that, that I think are great. Uh, we found several diamondiferous kimberlites in Finland. And we, we haven't gone back to Finland for a while because of the pandemic, but we will, we will get back there. But, it's, it's a great project, but diagrass is more important. And we, we joint ventured out Stein, another very interesting diamond project to a, to a joint venture partner because we want to focus on our main projects. Um, yeah, uh, I'm introduce myself for the, those that don't know me. Um, um, I, uh, my, my claim to fame, my biggest claim to fame is leading the team that found Divik, uh, one of the diamond mines north of Yellowknife in the 1990s. And uh, it was a really, very fun time. And uh, I, I took that discovery from, from discovery uh, all the way through to when we cut the ribbon and the, and the mine opened. And it was a $1.4 billion build where we had to build dikes and make it, it was like Holland. We had to make a Holland, put dikes out in the lake because the Kimberlites run to the lake. And then we open pitted the Kimberlites in the lake. And that, that thing paid for itself in, um, in less than 18 months. The, paid for the $1.4 billion bill in less than 18 months. And uh, this year we had David Kelsch, who used to work with me back then, and he found one of the Kimberlites in Divik. So you've got over 70 years of experience in diamonds working on the team. Okay. So um, I'll go to the next slide. So. The really interesting thing was during, during um, the pandemic, jewelry stores were closed. People were postponing weddings. Diamond market crashed, um, 2020. But now here in 2022, we had historic diamond prices. They're the highest they've ever been. And that's mainly due to supply and demand. The demand's come back. People are suddenly all getting married. And also uh, some key mines shut down. Uh, in particular, Argyle in Australia, it supplied 25% of the world's diamonds by carat weight, uh, about five to eight percent by value, and that that's shut for good. And there's been a couple other mines in Botswana and Russia where they've gone underground, where the throughput isn't as much as when you open pit, so their production rates have dropped off. So we we are seeing a point right now that's sort of been predicted for. 15 years that uh, supply and demand would meet and demand would go past supply. And uh, so we are discovering these new diaminiferous kimberlites in a, in a very good environment that I think is long-term. You know, it takes many years to get discovery and get something into production. So we're, we're ahead of the pack to try and fill this gap in, in, di in diamond demand that's, that's materialized. And everyone's re re very interested in the um, diamond market. There's a very good summary done by Bain & Co. Uh, just Google Bain & Co um, diamond report and that sums up the world's diamond market beautifully. It's a free uh, report. Um, again, uh, this is taught, giving a bit, bit of a bigger view of the long-term diamond market, but that graph on the left hasn't been updated for today's um, 
uh, highest prices. We're, we're at 200 on that graph at the moment. And you can see how that's higher than, than any, anything in the last 20 years. Uh, and then the uh, market cap of the basket of diamond equities has been plunging down. So uh, it, 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 that doesn't make sense anymore because we have record diamond prices. That, that's got to change. Um, so I'll talk about that. That's just a very quick overview of um, the diamond market. It's a $16 billion a year market. Lithium is $8 billion, so it's twice as big as lithium. Um, so where, where are we? Uh, we're north of Yellowknife, um, about 360 k's north of Yellowknife. There is a permanent, nothing, a winter road that's been there for 30 years. And you can see traces of it on this map. There, there's, there's a winter road going through there. And it comes up through the lakes. So we're, we're only, our property is the blue and yellow. And you can see the purple circles around the current producing mines. Divic, the one I discovered, my, me and my team discovered, and Akadi, which was Chuck Pipke, BHP. It's now owned by Canadian Arctic Diamonds, a private company. Um, last year, Akadi made $8 million, $800 million in revenue. Uh, so on our property, all those little green dots are known kimberlites, and the red ones are the ones that we've discovered. Uh, that, the property used to be held by De Beers back in the 90s, but unlike um, Chuck and BHP's team in Akadi and uh, my, my team in Divic, we found something, so we kept getting funded. And there were over 220 kimberlites found, and you only get about eight weeks to uh, drill on the ice. Most of the kimberlites are underwater. So uh, we would just find a kimberlite, put one hole into it, assume that it, the model says they're carrot shaped. So we just put one hole across the proposed carrot shape from the model and then send sample off to the lab. And if it had diamonds, we would come back. If it didn't, we never went back. But late in the exploration program when I was in Rio Tinto and Divic, uh, we went back to some of the kimberlites where we only put one hole into and did gravity. We did different types of geophysics, gravity, EM and mag on the ground. And I, I went and reviewed uh, many of the kimberlites in this area. And we found that they're not all pipe, they're not all a simple carrot shape, that there can be multiple eruptions. So a carrot shape here, carrot shape here, carrot shape here. So they form strange shapes. And so I went back and successfully found neither increase the size of kimberlites or found new kimberlites right next to ones we already discovered. And they were all much more diaminiferous than the original discovery. They were less magnetic. And uh, I thought I'd just take that idea to the beers ground because they never found any and they stopped getting funded. So I only put one or two holes into their kimberlite. And so our, our biggest discovery, we're sort of looking for two types of targets on the property. One that are new standalone kimberlites that the beers missed. And second type of target is where it isn't just a simple carrot shape, it's a multiple, very complex body. And that wasn't realized back in the 90s. And we've used the latest, uh, we've just flown the latest um, technology EM 30 years ahead of its time from when, it, when De Beers flew their data. So we're, we're armed with a much better data set and, and it's working. We're finding kimberlites, diaminiferous kimberlites. Uh, our most exciting discovery is a thing we call Sequoia. It's a kimberlite complex. Uh, it sits about 30 k's from Divic, as you can see in the image, and uh, about 34 k's from Akadi. Uh, you can see there's a, a road branching out from the Akadi uh, processing plant um, that goes down to uh, to a, kim a bunch of kimberlite pipes here, Misery, Misery North and Sable, and they truck at 27 kilometers to the processing plant. So, you know, these processing plants are about 800 million each. It would make a lot of sense not to build one and use one of these, neither by if Sequoia turns out to be economic. Um, so you'd neither get contract processed or come to sort of pro a processing arrangement with one of those two plants. 
and that would save you lots of startup money. Um, why do we like Sequoia? Uh, Sequoia is just north of a, a pipe that De Beers found called Jack Pine. So we stayed with the tree naming, um, uh, De Beers started naming their pipes after trees. So we stayed with the tree idea and called it Sequoia. But you can see from these cost occlusion diamond results that Sequoia has many more diamonds, at least double the diamonds that uh, Jack Pine had and, uh, and, and more bigger ones. So it's a very, we think it's a totally different, this, I think we, we say that's proof that it's a totally different discovery to Jack Pine that the beers didn't realize was there. It, it's hard to know what the beers did. It's a very secretive organization and they didn't publish most of their work. They only published the minute, minimum amount of work that they had to for assessment, government assessment. Um, so here's a, what, what we do in the diamond exploration industry is we take those cost fusion results and we plot them on a graph. This is a graph with the size of the diamonds at the bottom. You can see one carat there. And then the number of um, stones per ton. And on these graph, if you get a smooth curve, um, you can use that to try and predict what the actual commercial grade would be. So the, the green here is our, our results from Sequoia to date, and the blue is Jack Pine. So you can see our, how our green curve is flatter. And uh, you can see, let, let's say, what, what the red line here is a, is a polynomial um, equation that bets fits the green curve projected out into bigger stone space. But let's say, oh, how many 10 carat stones we might get? And then you look it up here and you, you go there and it's saying, uh, about one every um, oh wait, uh, every 800 tons. Yeah, every 800 tons. That, that, that's quite amazing if we got a 10 carat stone every 800 tons, but, you know, when you're mining 30,000 tons a day. Um, so yeah, the, uh, if that holds out, that's very exciting. The blue line here, you can see how the curve is still um, wobbly, for want of a better word. Um, so I, 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 I had the eyeball in a, a, a pessimistic curve. What, what's the worst that could happen? And so that, 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 grade, that grade is about 0.24 carats a ton, and that grade is 0.72. So what, what, with the current results, we're saying our grade is going to fall within those two curves. Um, we've just taken approximately 1.9 tons of sample from Sequoia in this year's program. And this is from half a ton. So we'll, we'll have three times the count. And I expect that curve to smooth out. And that's one way I know that we've taken enough sample. Once you take enough sample that that curve stops moving and forms a shape and it doesn't change, you'd know you've got enough sample to, to really use that curve to predict the grade. And you know, I did this work for Divic. I predicted 4.2 carats a ton. When they mined it, it was 4.2 carats a ton, it works. Um, so there, here, what is Sequoia? Um, here's, here's a, you can see these little blue, dot, blue dots are where De Beers drilled, and there's a couple hidden in this blue zone here. That, that's where Jack Pine is. And then we, we discovered this stuff going to the north of Jack Pine. We called it Sequoia. You can see, unlike Jack Pine on this electromagnetic image, that Sequoia conducts where Jack Pine doesn't. So uh, it, it, again, it's showing Sequoia is something different. And we also have a lot of exploration targets. You can see how these targets look very similar to Sequoia. And we got to get around to drill testing them. Uh, again, uh, Sequoia in the gravity. So that, that we're looking at about a kilometer in that blue zone, kilometer long. Uh, there's Sequoia in ground EM and Sequoia in ground mag. So what we tried to do this year was, we, we whacked two holes into it last year, 200 meters apart, and they had good diamond results, but similar diamond results, 200 meters apart. So we started systematically uh, drilling out Sequoia uh, on a 100 meter grid, and we might have to bring that down to a 50 meter grid to get 
a 43101 tonnage. And you've seen from the micro diamonds, we'll get a view of the grade and we'll see if the different types of geology in the um, kimberlite have different diamond counts. So we'll, we'll get an idea of grade distribution. But the different thing about diamonds is each diamond has got a unique price. And the, the, the only way we can figure out if this is economic or not, let's give it half a carat a ton, which is well within the prediction I showed you before. Um, we, uh, we, need, we need to go and get about a thousand carats and in a bulk sample and get that process. And then you take those thousand carats to four or five different diamond buyers and that all give you a different price. But then you, uh, you gauge who's been the fairest or most realistic and or just take the average and that's your dollars per carat. So the only way you can know if these things are economic is to multiply the grade carats per ton by dollars per carat and you'll get dollars per ton. And the dollars per ton has to be bigger than the cost of mining it. Um, this slide just quickly is what I was talking about before is drilling out the pipe at about, well, there's 200 meter centers. And we, we got two of those done this year. We need, we need to do the rest in the future. Um, so he, here's all the 43101 Kimberlite pipes. This is from 43101s in 2014. I'd like to note that the price of diamonds has gone up significantly since 2014, but these are 2014 prices. And you look at the range of grades that are being mined at Akati and Divik, and they range from a low of 0.27 carats a ton um, at Fox, and you know up to uh, 4.5 carats a ton at Misery. With the, the the things that I found down here, all sort of high, higher than one carat a ton pipes. But you know there is a 0.2 being mined. There's a 0.6. So in the range that I think we've got a grade, things are being mined. So then the, I've already said the other aspect is price. So if you look at the price range from the 43 one, 2014, 43101s, and the, the worst price being mined is, or planned to be mined, is $74 a carat. But we see Koala's got 420. And if you take an average of these, it's about 200. And, uh, and in today's prices, that'd be maybe 250, 280. And uh, so if we, had, if we had just average diamonds in Sequoia, and we have half a carat a ton, we, we've got a mine. Because you look at that, that, that would be um, $120 a, a ton. And uh, you can see uh, that that's sort of well in the range of what's being mined. Um, they're mining them successfully. So the, the mining costs up there, it is remote it's on a w winter road. It's about $70 a ton open pit Canadian. These are US dollars. So, you know, if, if we got just the average diamonds out of Sequoia, it, it looks economic. And uh, this is just another graph talking to that and the general um, cost, per, cost per ton to mine versus uh, value per ton. I've already talked to that. Um, so, you know, just if we get the average, we think Sequoia can be good, but it's a risky business and uh, you like to get more layers of evidence to give you the courage to move forward and spend, spend shareholders money. So what I really like about Sequoia is I've already shown you the uh, diamond curve and it's quite flat, suggesting we're gonna get big stones quite commonly. And uh, that's, a, that's a really good result. Um, and then on top of that, uh, we see that, um, that the lab that did our micro diamonds described every, every, mic, every stone, the, over 400 stones we got, all are described as clear and white. And at, for example, at Divic, the, the percentage was only 30, 36% clear and white, where here we have 100. So it's a suggestion that we're gonna have, um, if that continues into the big stone space, we're, 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 in, we're in the money. Um, and then the other layer of evidence is that Chuck Fibke, uh, he's famous for playing, finding Icardi and he um, runs a lab and he has a massive private database and he's got 15 pipes where these 
large stones, uh, one of them shown here, bigger than 10 carats, usually bigger than 50, that they, uh, they're called clippers. Uh, Cullen and Light, which is the biggest stone ever found, Cullen and Light diamonds. Um, he sees, he's got 15 pipes around the world that produce these unusual, large, beautiful, clear stones. Um, and he looked at our data and he just got so excited. He said, you've got, you've got that chemistry, he calls it dollar DI. And uh, he said, you've got it in spades. From the 15 kilograms I sent him, he said, I picked more of these dollar DI uh, Dunnus and Pliniproxines than I've ever picked from 15 producing pipes that make these big diamonds. So that's another layer of evidence that we're looking at big diamonds. So what these diamonds are from great depth. And all the diamonds from great depth are, are nitrogen free, very pure carbon. So Chuck, Chuck's evidence would suggest our, pipe, our diamond should be, should have a nitrogen free, it's called type two, should have a type two population. So then we went back to the diamond lab in Saskatchewan, the government run diamond lab in Saskatchewan and said, can you study our diamonds and see how much nitrogen's in them? And we just recently put out a news release of those results. And we have 50% of our population as type twos, sort of predicted by Chuck. And uh, it, it's, I found it very satisfying to have all these lines of evidence agree with each other. And uh, to give you an idea, worldwide, only 2% of the diamonds are type twos. And here we have 50. Um, and they're all, what can go wrong with the type twos? They're coming from great debt. They can be stressed and they, uh, they look brown and they get a lot, much lower price than if they're clear. But as I've already said, every one of our diamonds so far are clear. Now we have to get a big diamond population and see what the big stones are doing to actually show it. But these are lines of evidence that, yeah, you should do that. It looks like it might, it all might, all, all, the, all the things might come together for us and we have a, a decent grade and decent price of diamonds. Um, and we, we flew, as I said earlier, we flew this um, airborne survey and we had too many targets to get to this year. We'll, we'll have to get to them as we go. But just to prove there's more Kimberlites here, we found Arbutus this year. Um, there's a photograph of it. It's got very beautiful, um, those big indicator minerals there. The red ones are garnet, the green ones are clinoproxene. And all, all those other fragments are olivines. We don't know its diamond content yet. We will find out. It's, it's already been shipped to the lab. Um, but having that sort of course, if you're going to have big diamonds and you've got a fine grain rock, there's nowhere to hide them. So if you've got a coarse grain rock, it, there's a place to hide them. You know? And, and these, these indicators are very delicate. So they don't survive the volcanic eruption very well. So uh, the fact that we've got um, big garnets that survive will tell us the diamonds would have survived too. So that, that's basically us. Um, the, uh, what, what are we doing now? We're, we're getting, we got six holes into um, Sequoia and we have Arbutus. So they're all going through the lab. And so we'll start getting diamond results mid July and um, we'll uh, get, keep getting them until mid August. And if Arbutus comes back good, it's on land. Most of the Kimberlites are in lakes like Sequoia. Arbutus is on land. If that comes back good, we can go back and drill it. Otherwise, we're, we're um, looking to try and get a bulk sample and delineate Sequoia more in the next winter road, which is mid-January. So that, that's, that's, what we, that's what our current plans are. So there'll be, there'll be new slow diamond results, very exciting, and plans to bulk sample it so we can get the price of diamonds to, to know for sure. After that bulk sample, we can actually do a pre fees so diamonds actually happen very quick once you get past that bulk sample stage. It, it's going to be about five million. So uh, that, that, that task is ahead of us. But yeah, thank you for your time and interest.